Good morning. morning. We're glad to see you. We're glad that we can be together. Our public reading of God's word is taken from the Psalms, as will be the message. And we will have our time of prayer together following the reading of the Psalms. Together. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. Let's join together first in silent prayer. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we do so with a sense of joy and thanksgiving that could be caused only by you and your gracious relationship with us We thank you for the grace that you have given to us through Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness that comes from that and for the life that we have. We ask our Father that you would guide us, direct us as individuals and as a congregation. We pray that you would use us to your honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand as we continue our worship service by the singing of the doxology. Would you please stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here going to have you turn and greet each other, but not with a holy kiss and not even a handshake. But we can wave and say hello. We're glad to see you. Would you do that, please? join together and sing Father God. Father God, I give thanks and praise to thee. Father God, my hands I humbly raise to thee. For thy mighty power and Please be seated.
Thank you very much, Mary. I appreciate it. We invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the 16th Psalm. As we focus our attention on Thanksgiving, I received some information over the radio that was really good. We can be thankful for it. Some medical outfit somewhere has predicted that we're only gaining seven pounds during this. And I kind of rejoiced in that because I can remember a time when I gained seven pounds just on the meal alone. So rejoice, you pure in heart. Look what we have. Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom, all, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is a beautiful one. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forever. And then I include this, some of this came out of yesterday's meeting with the men. I don't know about you, but that was one of the times of greatest blessing I've had since we've started that Saturday breakfast. And by the time they got through, I thought, I'm going to have to go home and rewrite my sermon. They took it all away. There's nothing left for me to say. And it seems as though we got around to this and the passage that Larry read in 1 Thessalonians. Notice, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. Notice that. Give thanks. I can remember probably as about a seven-year-old, my grandmother sat me down and said, now make a, a list of all the things that you can be thankful for. You know, that was hard to do. I knew the things that made me happy, but I'm not too sure I was ever thankful about all of that. And so I sat there for a while, and so I thought, well, I'm going to have to give my grandmother something, otherwise I'll never get to go outside and play. So I started writing down the things that made me happy. And pretty soon I found that I was being thankful. And this is one of the very natural things, is it not? Things that make us happy are things that make us say thank you. But what about the disasters of life? What about some of the difficult and near to impossible things to endure, that we've had to endure? The loss of children, the loss of spouses, the loss of a job, property, all of these things. I think I've shared with you before, when Alice and I were first married and we started going to Fountain Avenue Baptist Church in Hollywood, a young couple invited us over for dinner. And as it turns out, she was born and raised in Germany. And she and her family were devout Christians. And the word got out that the SS was out to get them. So they took off on the run, trying to at least get to France and hopefully to England. And they ran by night and hid by day. And they ran out of food. And they sat down one night and they could go no farther. 
and they prayed to the Lord to at least give them some kind of food that we can have the energy to get out of here. It was a cloudy night, and just about the time the prayer meeting ended, the clouds gave way, the moon was shining through, and there they were sitting in a strawberry patch. That strawberry patch was like a seven-course meal to them as they got up and made their way to the white cliffs of Dover. And there was great thanksgiving in the lives of those people. And so it is we have to face so many of the good things and we say thankful. But is it really true that we can give thanks for all things? Can we give thanks for all of the difficulties and the hardships and the trials and the disasters that come? It seems that we might be able to when we take a look at giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us that Joseph went through some tremendous tribulation and he finally came to the understanding and the conclusion that his brothers meant all of that for evil, but God meant it for good. And the same thing about Job. He didn't know what God was doing with him. And he got very upset. But in the end, he found out the faithfulness of God. And that seems to be the thing that we need to learn many times over again as Christians, that we can give thanks to God for everything. And sometimes that is difficult to do. It requires the ability to see an overriding goodness that compels us to be thankful. Notice that David said, You are my Lord. I have no good beside you. Notice that statement twofold. One, you are my Lord. As soon as he said, you are my Lord, what else did he say? What else is implied in that? You are my Lord, and I am your servant. That wherever one confesses Jesus as Lord, that person is also confessing that he or she is the servant of the Lord. And we see that it begins here that David testifies to a source of happiness, a source of thanksgiving, and a source that will be sufficient. The support of the system. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. Notice one of the things that you have heard from this pulpit often over the years. And that is that God did not promise to keep hard things away. He promised that we would make it through the hard times. The valley of the shadow of death was one that he had to walk, but he was not afraid. And he testifies to the goodness. And for this reason, he says, preserve me, O God. Let's back up for a moment to the verse before because I want us to take a look at this and keep it in mind. I have no good except for you. The foundation of his pillar of faith was based upon the goodness of God. I find my goodness in you, Lord, and in you alone. I have no other source. And with that in mind, he has no choice except to say, preserve me. Preserve me out of your goodness, for I take refuge in you. There is my statement of faith. There is how I find my foundation for thanksgiving. I take refuge in you and in no other. And it is the only source of good. So notice again we read, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, and I have no good besides you. There is nothing that will contribute to the well-being of my life other than my relationship with you and yours with me. It's the reason for my existence. It is the reason 
for my joy. And we see this again in Psalm 73. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. And I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. But as for me, this is the consideration that I have given to myself, and I have come to this conclusion that your nearness is my only good. And when we are bound together by faith, this becomes the statement of the people of God, that you and your nearness is our good. And there are oftentimes many other things that we at least inadvertently make something of the foundation of our faith. But that has to go. The only thing that is worthy is the God who made us and who sustains us. But as for me, it reminds us very much, does it not, of Joshua, when he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so we see it here as it carries down through time. As for me, just the very nearness of God is my good. And for that reason, I have made the Lord God my refuge. Notice he understands clearly that God did not promise to take all of the difficulties, the trials, and the tribulations away. He did promise to be there for us. He did promise to be our refuge. And notice the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. That when life is over and we settle everything up, what has been expended, what has been received, what is left after all the taxes are paid and everything like that when it comes to the reading of the will, that what is left for me is the Lord. The, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and he is my cup. He is the one who will sustain me because you support my lot. And it should be that for those of us who have been walking with the Lord for some time, we can be able to read these words and say, this too is my testimony. That in the end, when I see everything else that I seek to support or be supported, there's the one ad that says, do you have enough time or do you have enough money? And it seems to me that no matter how we answer that, the question still comes back to, I have enough in my Lord. And this is the support system that David found. And notice that this is the source of his thanksgiving. This is the source of his prayer. Again, as a young man, always on Thanksgiving Day, Denver University would play against the University of Wyoming. And it was on Thanksgiving Day, early in the morning. And so we would go out, even in the snow, and we would root for Denver University. Now, if you know anything about Denver University, they made a huge grandstand that they could never fill. And I think it had to do with the caliber of their football players. I'm not really sure about that. But we rooted for everything, and it was a good, good Thanksgiving day to go home after the football game and have a great turkey with the relatives, the family, and to say Denver University won. Now, if I go back to those years and see what, how many times they did, it may be that my rejoicing was few and far between on that score. But at any rate, we have things that come into our lives that make us happy. But we should never forget the root of our happiness is also the cause of our thanksgiving. The Lord is my portion. And notice his support system was a person. His support system was the God who is the creator, sustainer, and redeemer. The sufficiency of that system, as for the saints who are in the earth, 
They are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Let's take a look at that for a moment. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones. When was the last time that you looked at your brother or sister in the faith and in the face and said, you are one of the majestic ones? Maybe we should start a church someplace and call it the Church of the Majestic Ones. And we'd have to be explaining ourselves all of the time. We're good, we're happy to be known as Lutherans, as Baptists, as whatever else. But in the end, when we gather together in the company of the faithful ones, as for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones. And notice, in whom is my delight. Especially at this time when everything seems to be upside down, in our nation, and some find their delight in Trump, some find their delight in Biden, by the end, we should be finding our delight in the Lord, as we should have been all along. And I know for many of us, that's been the truth of the case. It, can, it includes community. And here is where we find much of our encouragement, in the company of the majestic ones, a source of delight. And not only a source of delight, but it is a source of contentment as well. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. It provides contentment. His heritage has fallen on pleasant places. I've never been to Israel. I doubt if I'll get there before the great call of the trumpet, but I've seen pictures of it, and so much of that I take a look at and I say, you know, I've lived in the desert for a long time, and I've really kind of enjoyed the desert, but I don't see any overwhelming beauty like you would see up in the mountains of Colorado or anywhere else, but to each his own, but at least in my limited thinking, it seems to me that the beauty is in the company, the company of God, the company of the majestic ones. I don't know, maybe at the door today as we go by and shake hands, I'll say, greetings, O majestic one. <laughs> and you better say majestic one back. <laughs> Notice that his hope, his future is bright. The lines of demarcation where I have my property, where I have my possessions, it's in a pleasant place. He has given pleasantness to me. And my heritage is beautiful to me. You may think it to be ugly, but I know it to be beautiful. And it affords not only contentment, but communion. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Notice that he profits from God's counsel. It is a sad day when the evangelical church has 53% of its participants saying that the scriptures alone are not sufficient. Because it seems to me that I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. And as was pointed out earlier by Larry, that counsel comes from God's word. And it seems to me the strength of our faith and the ability to grow and to be strong is directly tied to our understanding of God's word. The lines have fallen in pleasant places, and it's at nighttime when I get my counsel from God. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, notice not in my feelings, but in my mind he instructs me in the night. It seems like insomnia may not be a bad deal after all. Depends on what you do with it, I guess. 
I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. There's no promise here, again, that God keeps us out of trials and trouble. But he promises to be with us, and his wisdom and his strength is at our disposal. He is at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. This is the foundation by which we can be thankful under all circumstances. There's that communion, and there is confidence. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. Confidence for the well-being of the total person. In the face of life's challenges, he will rejoice and he will be glad. And so it seems to me that in the midst of the, cha of the challenges that we have here and the challenges that God's people have everywhere, it still comes back to whether or not we find our security in the Lord. My flesh also will dwell securely. And notice, in the face of life's challenge, he will rejoice, he will be glad, he will dwell securely, and notice, notice even at the point of death. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. At the point of death, he is not subject to annihilation. He will not be abandoned. And of course, we keep in mind that this is the passage that Peter uses, I think, in Acts chapter 4 to speak of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He possesses life. You will make known to me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Notice that he possesses life. And this is the one thing that I seem to pick up from our people who can still be thankful in dark times. They know that what is going on presently is only temporary. And they know that there will some good thing come out of it. Again, we, re we go back to Joseph who said to his brothers, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. And if that is not the time when the psalmist says God is in the heavens and he does as he pleases, we are glad that he's there doing as he pleases because that which is evil he intends for good. So then, the sufficiency of the system, you will make known to me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Once, I forget where now, but I think it was in a book. Strange thing. But what I read was that in order to have a strong economy, a nation must keep its people dissatisfied. If today, you are capable of owning a Ford or a Chevy. Work real hard so you can get a Buick or an Oldsmobile. And after you get that, work hard so you can get a Cadillac. And then maybe a Mercedes Benz. But never be happy, never be satisfied with what you have. And that makes for a strong economy. But you and I have a different economy by which we live. And that is the satisfaction that God gives to us through the person of Jesus Christ. You will make known to me the path of life. And in that life, it is not just quantity. It is quality as well. For notice we see in your presence is the fullness of joy. Sometimes it is strange that we would think it to be a burden to live for Christ, because at least his word teaches us that in living for him and having a right relationship with him, 
This is the source of joy by which we give thanks. Notice that when we take a look at what we're challenged with, the Lord is the source of all blessing, both temporal and eternal, both material and spiritual. So we should be thankful on both counts. Notice from men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life, and whose belly you fill with your treasure, they are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. Notice that even those who would deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ still get their blessings from him. And as he gives out his blessings, they are satisfied. But notice their satisfaction does not go back to the source. Their satisfaction looks ahead to their immediate end and what they are going to do with what they have gathered. And so they gather up and they give to their babies, their children, and they go off into eternity with nothing. As the scriptures say in Ecclesiastes, we come into this world with nothing and we take nothing with us. And there will be any degree of joy, but it stops in time. But we keep in mind that God is the source of gifts that are for time and gifts that are for eternity. And we give thanks to him on both counts. And that seems to be a part of our challenge, to make sure that we do this in both counts. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness, and I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. It seems that our source of satisfaction speaks to our valuing of God's blessing. If we do not want to have anything to do with God, why would we want to spend eternity with him? Do I seek the temporal in prayer and thanksgiving over seeking the eternal over the temporal? Or do I seek the eternal over the temporal? The men of this world receive their blessing for this life from God, and they are satisfied with the gift, but not with the giver. You will make known to me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand there are pleasures forever. The family of faith accepts both values. We accept that new car but we do it with thanksgiving and we have it in its proper place. This is a temporal gift and it should not take the place of the eternal gift. So do I seek the temporal in prayer and thanksgiving over seeking the eternal, which is of importance to me? And you will make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand there are pleasures forever. Notice it is not either or. Over the years I've heard preachers say it's either mammon or God. In one context that is true, but in another context mammon is not there, just the gifts of God that he gives to us richly to enjoy, Paul says, but not to place our hope in it. So it is a matter of priorities. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
but we will be thankful because we know the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and we know that we have a place in that kingdom. So let's be thankful in all things. I've seen it happen. I've seen people in some very dark situations, and their hearts are broken. But nevertheless, they still have room to be thankful to God and his faithfulness, and they know that he will bring them through, and they know that he will bring something great and glorious out of something that is really a, tri a terrible, terrible thing. So let's always seek first his kingdom. And let's get back to where we started for breakfast yesterday. Whoops, I'm a little bit ahead. I left one thing out. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And do not quench the spirit. After all is said and done, I've been getting teased lately about me and the doxology. So, I'm in your face. Notice it. It's purple and white. It stands out. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer this Thanksgiving week and we look at everything about us, there seems to be turmoil and yet there is hope. There are those who speak of the reset of the global joy, but we rejoice in the coming of the King. And we ask our Father that we give thanks for what you do for us in terms of time and what you do for us in terms of eternity. And may we rejoice and be glad. And even in the darkest times in our lives, should they come, we ask that we can see the joy of light because we see the great King in all of his glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen.